Hello everybody and welcome to chapter number four. This is Professor Algara and I'm just going through chapter number four in statics. We're going to study a lot of things right now. Chapter four is one of the most important one. Uh, we're going to be learning about momentum of force, um, scalar formulation, vectorial formulation, cross product, moment of force, um, distributed loads, and so many other things. So when we talk about the moment of a force, the moment of a force about a point provides a measure of the tendency for rotation and sometimes we call that as a torque and the torque is defined as uh, force times distance being distance or being the um, f times z being f the force and the the perpendicular distance from point o to the line of actions of the force line of action is defined as the line in which the force is applied so d will be perpendicular to that and then that will give us a sense of rotation into the, the direction of moment is either uh, clockwise or counterclockwise depending on the tendency of the rotation and we'll develop um, a way of you know learning how to get that tendency of rotation for example the moment um, like i said it's f times d and the direction in this particular case you know you have your moment o and then the force that is right next to it at, at a distance d so d will be you know the perpendicular distance from the point to the line of action which is described by the force in this particular case is counterclockwise and the best way to determine that is by pinning being um, if you pin on o and then you try to move the force you know that will give you this rotation which is you know um, counter clockwise <sighs> okay so it is often and sometimes that what we're going to study uh, it's easier to determine the moment in vectorial components and what we do with that as we've been doing from chapter number two is that we decompose the force in fx and fy as far as the sign convention, and, and this is for the sign convention for uh, the moment, um, is that counterclockwise is considered positive and we can determine the direction of rotation by imagining, like I said, the body pin at a point O and then deciding when, uh, which way the body will rotate because of the force in this particular case. If you pin right here and then you have the force, you know, it will be rotating into that direction, which is in the opposite direction of the of the watch, or or as we call it, counterclockwise. And that will consider, and that we consider to be positive. You know, finding the moment in two D is very straightforward, and sometimes we know the distance, and sometimes we don't know the distance, and that when when we don't know the distance is actually a problem because. Um, we will have to do a lot of assumptions and we will have to develop equations to further find that distance or sometimes it's in terms of f, of f. And what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, by using vectors, it might be easier to find those components. And that's what we're about to um, study, something that is called the vector cross product. So in general, the cross product of two vectors a and b result in another vector c you know, and the magnitude and direction of the resultant vector can be written as, you know, C, it's equals to the product of AB, and that's equals to AB as the module sine theta multiplied by the unit vector. And just remember that the unit vector, the unit vector, it's perpendicular to both A and B, and that's what gives us actually the, the direction. Uh, vector number C, uh, I'm sorry, vector C, it's always perpendicular to the plane that that is formed with the two vectors, you know, so these vector a and b will form a plane and then vector c or the multiplication of those vectors will be um, a line that is perpendicular to that plane. There is something very important, especially when we talked about uh, unit vectors, you know, uh, the right hand rule is it's a very useful tool to determine the direction of the vector resulting from the cross product and, and the hand um, rule and the right hand rule I'm pretty sure it's been used uh, by you in physics uh, but I'm just going 
to go over it again so you can remember. So basically what it does, if you have your right hand as the picture shown right here, um, if you open your right hand and then and then you have all the fingers, for example, and, and let's just focus on this one right here, K it's equal to I um, cross J. So if you have, if you open your fingers towards I and then you close your hand towards J, your thumb will be pointing upward and therefore that will be the positive side of K. So if, the, if it's the, the opposite way, for example, that goes from I to minus J, to minus J, then your thumb will be pointing to the downside of K and therefore you will have a negative value. Know that a vector cross into itself will be always zero. So I, I cross I will be zero, J cross um, J will be zero, K cross k will be zero and this picture right here it shows you as a you know as a regular manner if you go um you know i times j as you close your right hand into j it'll be positive because it's pointing um upward and then if you go from j to k it'll be the same thing if you go from k to y if you go in the opposite direction then it will be negative this is very important when it comes to moments and you will see that especially towards the end of the chapter. So the cross product um, can be written as a determinant and as a, as a determinant, sorry for my accent. Um, if you have a, a cross B and you have components for A, a and B, you know, a, AX, AJ, and AZ, and BX, BY, and BC, um, and then you deploy I, J, and K as a matrix, and then you start solving that matrix, then you will be able to get each one of the components of the resultant vector A cross B. So how so? And this is actually something that we that we had seen before in algebra or, or uh, trigonometry, but you know, I'm just going to give you a refreshment of this. I have added also on Blackboard a video um, on how to get this whole matrix resolved as I don't wanna, you know, if I, if I start explaining algebra right now, this lecture will be maybe um, over an hour and that's not what I'm looking for. But anyways, when you have two vectors, A cross B, and you have your matrix, the way to solve the matrix, you know, for element I, you have to cross I and then multiply this in this direction, as you can see right here. So A Y times B Z minus A Z times B Y, um, that will give you the I element. And then remember that you know, the second element is always negative. And then, like I said, I posted a video on Blackboard that explains why, in case you have forgotten. Um, for J, you cross J, and then you repeat the same process as for Y, and then for K, you will cross K, and then you will repeat the same process. That's all. And then if you keep, um, you know, if we're now moving forward into what's coming next, you will see why we use it. So, we talked about the cross product, you know, of two random vectors. And the reason why is because of this vector formulation that now we're going to solve the moment in a vectorial form. So moments in 3D can be calculated using a scalar approach or 2D, and it can be difficult and time consuming. So sometimes, sometimes it's easier to use a mathematical approach called the vector cross product. Using the vector cross product, we can define that the moment around O it's equals to R times F, being R the position vector from o, o to any point on the line of actions of, uh, and the line of action of F. Sorry for my English. <laughs> so using the cross product or the multiplication, right? It's the same matrix that we had before. We're gonna be given the unit vector I, J, and K, and then the components of R, X, R, Y, R, Z, and then F, X, F, Y, and F, um, C. And then after that, we're going to solve the same thing as we did before as we were talking, and then uh, we will get this equation. Of course, it seems like a very long equation, but once we give, we give numbers to this equation, it will make sense. And that's what we're going to do right now. So we're given with a uh, force right now that is applied to the frame, and then we need to calculate um, the moment of the force at point O, you know? 
So what we need to do is just have a plan, you know, once we read the statement as always. So uh, we have to decompose the force into the X in the Y direction. And then after that, we just need to find the moment around that point. And how do we do that? So very simple. So I'm going to decompose FX and FY. So FX, it's equals to 100. That multiplies 3, 5, 3 fifth and no, sorry, my bad, Fy and Fx. So Fy will be equals to 100, that multiplies 3 over 5 because of similar triangles right here. You can get that. And then Fx will be equals to 100, that, mul that is being multiplied 4 fifth, and that's Fy and Fx. So now if I want to apply a moment or the sum of moments, around O, I have to apply the formula, as you know, you know, moment that's equals to force times D, okay? So if we go with the Y direction first, we need to know exactly how the forces it's applied. Um, and, we're gonna, and we're going to use the sign convention for force, which is counterclockwise, it's positive, okay? So if counterclockwise is positive, then we need uh, to determine how this component will be acting on at round O. So remember you pin O and then how this force it's it's how does this force will move the frame? It'll move it into this direction, right? Which is counterclockwise or clockwise? It's counter no, I'm sorry, it's clockwise. Therefore that moment is negative and it'll be equal to 100 you know that multiplies that is multiplied by 3 fit because it's a y direction and then this is multiplied by the distance in the in you know from here from that line perpendicular to the line of actions of the force in this case it's 5 right okay and then the second one would be um, this component so it's trying to do the same thing, therefore it's also negative, and that will be 100, that is we multiply 4 fifth, and then the distance in the, in, in the y direction, which is from here to the line of action, so therefore it's 2. And then this will give us a final value of 460. Newton meters negative or also has 460 newtons meter clockwise all right and that's it for the example it makes a little bit more sense when we give numbers so a second example and you know that i'm not used to do these kind of things but we have two forces f1 and f2 and then we just need to find uh, the resultant moment around O. And that's simple. We need to find a resultant force between F1 and F2. Once we have the resultant, we just need to get the vector, the position vector that goes from zero to that F. And after that, we just need to perform um, the, the cross product and that's it. So how do we do that? So we have that F1 actually it's right here f1 it's 100 you know right here and f2 is this one so f1 plus f2 will be equals to f a hundred minus 200 and that's in the i direction then plus minus 120 plus 250 okay so if we move by right next we will get that the force it's equals to minus 100 i plus 130 J 
plus 175k. And I hope you're following me. Don't forget your units. This is pounds. So the distance R O A. It's 4i plus 5j plus 3k. And this is fit. And that's given by these three guys right there. I don't have to explain you that. So now what we have to do is perform the calculations. So MO it's equals to R O A times the resultant force. So if I do that, MO will be equals to I J K and then I have minus one hundred one thirty. Oh no, sorry. MO will be equals to I, J, and K. And then I have the position vector, which is 4, 5, and 3. And then the other one that it's minus 100, 130, and 175. I made a mistake, but remember that moment is equals to R times F, not the other way around. So when I solve that, I should get that moment in O and like I said if you want like I said the Y direction you just close Y and then for J you close J and then for K you close K that's exactly what I just explained and I'm not gonna get into that but the resultant moment will be equals to 485 I minus a thousand J plus 1020 K and this is pounds fit Okay, and that's it. That's how you get it. So that's how you use the vector multiplication. And even though it's, a, I would say, like a tedious process, I just wanted to know that as far as the exam goes, I will try to keep it in the scalar form. But it's always very useful to introduce you to the vectorial form as well. Okay, so, and the reason why it's very important, because now I'm going to explain you how to move the moment to a different axis. So I just want to, you know, move along with this. So sometimes you have, um, you know, different, you have a specific X, Y, and Z. And that X, Y, and Z, um, it's actually what give you the direction for your forces. But what about if the forces or the moment are not aligned with X, Y, and Z? You will have then to move your components into these specific axes. So like this, for example, in the figure above, right? If we need to get moment around Y, we just need to get the force in the Z direction and multiply that by the X component of the distance, which is very straightforward. It's just F that multiplies R cosine theta. That should be very easy, but sometimes, like I said, finding the X or finding the other one could be like a huge puzzle for you and that's why it's very important that you learn how to get that with the usage of another tool and that's what I'm where I'm getting to just remember that when you multiply F and R I'm sorry this is R and then F that will form a plane and your moment is perpendicular to that plane that moment is not aligned with Y X or Z and then if you need to find the moment in Y, you might have to use the dot product or the cross product. So what I'm getting into this, you know, or, or basically what I'm trying to explain is that sometimes the moment will have to be aligned with an axis that you want it to. And it's very hard for me to keep this um, arbitrary, you know, if, 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 if that's a way to explain it. But let's just read what it says. Our goal is to find the moment F about an axis, whatever axis, and we're call that axis as an A axis. At first, we need to compute uh, the moment of the force about that axis that lies on, on, the, on the A axis using the cross product. But then, you know, in order for you to find that the component of that moment that you just calculated, you will have to apply the dot product to that cross product that you just apply. 
or as we call it, the triple scalar product. So let me just go back because it's a little bit confusing. So you will have your moment due to a force and that moment needs to be aligned to an axis A. So you will calculate the moment with the force and like this, for example, you will calculate your moment as you did right here with the formula and then you will use the dot product to decompose that moment into the axis that you want it to. I hope that this makes sense because it's not easy to explain it and, and I know it's not easy to understand it. Basically what you will be doing, you will apply the cross product as it is stated by all the books and everything to find your moment and then you will use the dot product to decompose that moment into the axis that you want. So it's very straightforward. That axis will be described by a unit vector. Okay, and the unit vector will be given, you know, by the exercise. Your position vector will also be given and your force vector will also be given. And each one of those elements will have X, Y, and Z or I, J, and K. You know, but let's just call it X, Y, and Z, assuming that that's what we wanted. We will perform the cross product and the dot product in one singular matrix like it is right here. And that's what it what it's called the triple scalar product. So let's just give numbers, you know, as everything will make sense. You know, I promise you that. So a force is applied to the tool that's shown. You know, you can see the force right here. And then we need to find the magnitude of the moment of this force about the x axis. What is the plan for this? So at first, we will have to decompose F into um, X, Y, and Z, or in a Cartesian vector form. Then we will have to use a unit vector that will describe, you know, what we need. We need to actually get the moment and then decompose that moment on the X axis. Then after that, we need to find our position vector, then from our position vector from O to A, and then perform the matrix, just like that. So the unit vector, we're gonna call that um, ux or u1, that will be equals to one in the i direction. Our position vector, let's just put the vector sign, it will be equals to zero in the i direction plus 0 0.3j and then plus 0 0.25k and that's meters. Don't forget your units, you know, given by this and this. And then after that, I just have to decompose the force into the, you know, thanks to the three angles that were given. So I will get a factor of 200 that multiplies cosine of 120i plus cosine of 60j plus cosine of 45k and that will be in newtons. So then now that I have that, you know, I will just keep solving this into a more simplified form and then I get minus 100i plus 100j plus 141.4k and all that in newtons. So all we have to do is to find the matrix. So mx will be equals to the unit vector ux that multiplies position vector times the force vector. And all of this is vectorial form, right? So mx will give me, actually mx will give me the moment, you know, as a number. My unit vector will be equals to 1, 0, 0. That will make your calculations a lot easier. Then your uh, position vector will be 0, 0 0.3, 0 0.25. And then your force vector will be minus 100, 100, and 141.4. You just have to solve the calculations, you know, in using the determinant that we 
that we calculated in the past and that we have developed at the beginning of the video and that will give you a final result of 17.4 newtons meters and that's the result okay just remember that this will make your calculations a lot easier because you don't have components in the other directions so that's how you put numbers into the equations and that's how you can use the triple triple scalar form like i said i'm, I'm not planning on putting this on the exam but i always you know i always want you to know the concepts a couple is defined as two parallel forces with the same magnitude but opposite in direction separated by a perpendicular distance d so we're going to be introduced to the scalar analysis and then you know vectorial analysis as well so in the case of the scalar, you know, like I said, you have two forces and then the distance between the forces will be called D and that's how you get the equation for the vectorial form. You will have to place um, a position vector to A and B and then the resultant vector R will be used along with the F. Now we move along. These moments of couple, of a couple, they're free to move, they're free vector. They could be applied anywhere. And as much as they can apply anywhere, they can also be used as a zoom of moments and they can be used or subtracted using the same um, rules that we've been using from chapter number two when training vectors. You know, as you can see here, so if you have a moment right here and a moment right there, then you can get a resultant moment from it. Okay, and, and at the end of the chapter, we'll learn how to simplify those moments in order to get, to get a resultant moment in the pictorial form. But, Sorry, but we can do the same thing to the scalar. It applies to both ways. So one of the applications, as you can see, you know, you have the same, um, the same wheel, but then the hands are separated, you know, farther apart in the first picture, and then they're closer on the on the second picture, and then it tells you that you need, um, you know, the torque for both of them will be 12 newtons, but the only difference is that you will need um, less force as your D becomes larger and that's actually the definition of a torque you know that will depend on the distance and the force and then your resultant torque will be actually dependent of those two variables and now we're gonna give numbers to this new acquisition um, scalar approach for this you know and that's where I'm, what I'm focusing on so we're giving with two couples and that act on the beam with the geometry shown we need to find the magnitude of f so the resultant couple moment um, is 1.5 kilonewtons um, clockwise remember that the positive the positive convention for moment is what clockwise or counterclockwise it'll be counterclockwise which means that this they're telling you that the resultant moment it's equals to minus 1.5 kilonewtons meters okay so we need to add the two couples to find the resultant force and then we need to um, equate the net all of that to 1.5 or minus 1.5 and then we have to solve for f it's simple so what we need to do is just remember remember what i told you right here that you can zoom all the moments with no problem so in order to get a resultant you just have to zoom this moment with this moment and then you get the resultant so that's what we need to do in this exercise so we have two uh, couples the one with the force f and minus f and then we have the one with two and two so if you remember the definition in the scalar um, form the moment or the couple moment will be f times the distance between them which is 0 0.9 and then the sign convention 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 will di dictate whether it's positive or negative and then we'll do the same thing with this so if we have um, the exercise you know the sum of the moment will be equals to or the moment the mo the resultant of the of the moment of a couple will be equals to the first couple that we have which is this so if we pin in the middle and then we have the force, what will happen with this line? 
the line will turn to be moved into this direction. And if that's the case, is that clockwise or counterclockwise? It's clockwise. And remember that counterclockwise is the positive sign. So therefore, the first one will be minus f that multiplies 0 0.9, which is the, the distance among them. So now the second one is this one. Okay, what would happen with this line if you apply the force into that direction? That will make it move into this direction, which is counterclockwise. Therefore, this couple is positive. So this will be equals to 2 that multiplies the distance between them, which is 0 0.3. This guy was given, it was minus 1.5. So if I re rewrite the equation, minus 1.5 will be equals to minus 0 0.9f plus 0 0.6. We solve for f, and then we get that f it's equals to 2, sorry, 2.33 kilonewtons. And that's it. Simple as that, guys. We have to keep it simple. We have to understand the theory in order to move with exercises. So I, I'm hoping that by now you're getting it, but don't forget to read the book. All right? And we get into the simplification of, of forces and, and couple system. So sometimes not sometimes most of the time you will have multiple forces acting into a body with different um you know inclinations and, and and different data when you have that data it is better to get a resultant force and then once you have the resultant force you can get the moment the resultant moment and with that you will be able to design your whole system for example, and, and, I, and I already explained that, you know, but, but let's just read it. Moving a force from A to B when both points are on the vector line of action does not change the external, that's, that's not change the external effect. Actually, this is called the sliding vector, and that's the principle of transmissibility, transmissibility, well, that, sorry, I explained that already, but it, what it basically states is that you know, whether you have the force right here, you're pulling or pushing, it will not have a change because it's the same effect. And that's why when you're doing your free body diagram, if you place your force right here, you place it right there, it'll be the same, okay? But what about, you know, when the, for, when the force is moved and is not along the line of action, then we have a change in the external effect. So what I'm trying to teach you right here it's actually how to move the forces from one point to another. Okay, so if you're studying, let's say you have the first picture right here. Boom. And you are trying to study what's happening at point B. Perfectly fine. You have your force, you have your D, you have the point A. Simple as that. But it'll be simpler if you move all the forces maybe to this point in order to simplify your calculations. You can do that. How do you do that? So in the second picture, you have your force right here, but then you add it, force and minus force. It shouldn't be doing anything. It should keep everything in equilibrium because you're not adding anything. But realize that this guy right here, F and minus F is now forming a moment of a couple. And that moment of a couple is equals to FB. And what, what is the definition of the moment of a couple? That is free to move along the whole beam because it's, it's a free vector. So now I will just create my couple and move it to the point in the study that was B. So now I move my force, you didn't realize, but I move my force to the point B and then create it or replace that with a moment that can be used in a formula for simplification. And that's what I'm trying to get to because we're about to study systems that will have multiple forces and those forces, they need to be moved in order to find resultants. When several, for, when several forces and couples moments act on a body, you can move each force and its associated couple moment to a common point. Oh, that's what we just did. And now you can add all the forces and couple moments and, and find a result of a resultant force couple moment pair, which is right here. You know, your force will be 
you know, the sum of all the forces and then your resultant moment will be all the moments you to couple, you know, as we move the forces and then the, any other moment that are applied from that point due to a force. So good example of that. So you have right here traffic lines and each one of them will have a weight or we can call that as a force. And as you move along with this, you are able to find a resultant force by just zooming all of them and then calculate the moments or move those lines from here to here by using what we just did. So now I have I will be able to move those forces by applying the moment formula, which is you know W1 times distance one plus W2 times distance two. So now I can study everything in that point and then make my calculations. And this is all being used for design purposes, okay? And they're given right here. So make sure you save that with you. So further simplification can be done. And what you need to understand is that this, it's equal to this. And both of them are a very simple way to work the forces. So in the first picture, you have all the forces, all of them in different places. And what you did on the second picture was to move all the forces to a common point in a study by adding a bunch of moments. And then when you had all those moments, that will create a resultant moment and therefore you, you should be able to design your system like that. But what about if you don't want the moment, you can then move your force at distance D and then decompress basically the moment into a component of F and D and then you have the same moment. No problem with that. All these, you know, this one, this one, and this one are methods that will help you to simplify your system. But how so? And we get into an example again. So you are giving with a 2D um, system of forces uh, with the geometry as shown. We need to find the equivalent resultant. We need to find the equivalent resultant force and couple moments acting at A and then the equivalent single force location measure from A. What should we do? Very simple. We should decompose all the components of these forces into X and Y directions. I mean, the ones that are not aligned with axis as this one, you know, and this one, this one is perfectly fine. Once I do that, I will find the sum of the moments resulting from moving each one of the components to the point A, and then I will use my final equation in order to find the distance. Let's just do it. So if I decompose and I didn't want to, you know, I want to show you because it's very simple. The sum of forces into the X direction or the resultant force, if I want to calculate that, I will sum all of the forces in the X direction. So the first one, I have 50 that multiplies sine of 30 and it's going to the positive side. Then I have, remember, this is one component. And then I have another component here, which is equals to 100 and multiplies 3 fifth, and that will give me a total of 85. So now if I need to find the resultant force of, in the y direction, I have 100 that is going up and then 50 cosine of 30, which is this one right here. And then I have minus 100 and multiply four by 4 fifth because of the similar triangles. And I will get the, res the result of the forces in the y direction, which is equals to 163.3 pounds. Then after that, I need to get the moments around A of each one of the forces. And, and, and right now you need to understand because the, this is when I'm using the theory to solve all this. I have 200 and multiplies 3 because of the 3 fit, right? You have 200, it's force times distance. Now we go with the next one, which is this one, 50 cosine of 30 and 9. What is this cosine of 30? This is only the component into the y direction. And why is that? Because you have you have a y direction, fy, and an fx direction. But note that the x direction it's actually coincident with the same line of, with the same line of A. So there's no distance between between the x component and A. Therefore, there's no moment. That moment is zero. It's not causing any moment. When you go to eight, 
right right here and you pin at a what's happening with the for with the force of y is trying to move it like this so therefore that moment will be positive that's why cosine of 30 times 9 3 plus 3 plus 3 is 9 and then I will do the same thing with this the y dire the y direction is the only one causing moment the x direction is not doing anything so therefore I will have minus 100 because it's causing this to rotate in the clockwise direction which is you know negative and then times 6 because from here to here I have 3 and 3 that's 6 and that will give me a total of 509.7 pound fit and that's counterclockwise because I got a positive value or you can just leave it as this and I will know because of this so once you have that you need to calculate your distance so moment it's equal to force times distance you already have a resultant force and you have the moment because we just calculated that this resultant force will have an x and y component but the only one making moment will be the y direction f r y that's the only one that is making moment and you need to find the distance of that resultant force how do you do that so m r a you know, all the sum of moments that I just calculated will be equal to my resultant force in Y times D. If I solve for D, that will be equal to moment RA over the resultant force in the Y direction. And both of them are given. One is 509.7 and the other one it's 163.3. And this is giving me a result of 3.3 one two fit that's it that's all um very straightforward if we handle to use if we handle to use the theory and then put the numbers in that's all we need to do okay and remember that that has been my goal from the beginning if we got if we want to learn a little bit more you can calculate actually you know, the module of your resultant force if you want to. Let's do it. Remember, both components, x and y direction. And just remember that 85 to the square plus 163.3 to the square. And that will give me the module of the resultant force, which is equals to 185.7 pounds. And you can check my math the angle it's equals to the inverse tangent of y over x which is 163.3 over 85 and that gives me an angle of 62.5 this was not required but i just wanted to show you that i'm using everything that we learned in chapter number two in order to get those results so now another problem giving a 2d force and couple system shown as you can see right here we need to find the resultant force and a couple moment acting on a so it's basically same thing as we did before we're going to decompose you know these forces then we will zoom all of them in order to find the resultant and then after that we will find all the moments resulting from moving the forces and add them you know to the 15 um to the 1500 newtons so how do we do that? Very simple. So the sum of forces into the x direction will be equals to 450 cosine of 60 minus 700 sine of 30. That will give me a total of minus 125 newtons. The sum of all the y directions will be equals to 450 sine 60 minus 300 minus 700 cosine of 30 and this is giving me a result of 
minus 1, 2, 9, 6 newtons. And now if I want to find, you know, the module of this resultant force will be equals to the both components. So the first one is 125 to the square plus 1296 to the square. Square root of that, that will give me a total of 1302 newtons. And please check my math. So the theta will be inverse tangent of 1296 over 125 and that will give me a result of 84.5 okay and now all we have to do sorry and now all we have to do is to find the moments or the sum of moments because that's what it what what is asked you know the sum of moment around a and we know that it is positive when it's counter Sorry, it is. It is positive when it's, you know, um, counter clockwise. So therefore, we have to calculate all of the moments due to these forces. So the first one that we have will be the Y component. And what is happening with this, if you pin on A, what would happen with this? Then you have clockwise, therefore the first one would be negative, minus 400, sorry, 450, minus 450 sine of 60 times the distance, which is 2. And then the second one would be 300, same case, is pointing into the same direction, so that's negative. 300, that multiplies the distance, which is 6, and the second and, and the third one, which is this guy, will be the same thing. It's minus 700 cosine of 30, that multiplied by 9, and then we have minus 15 because that's a negative moment based on the sign conviction that we had so if we do all that calculations that will sum up to 9535 newton meters and that's negative or you can also say that is 9535 newton meters going as a clockwise Either way, it works the same way for me, okay? And that's it. I hope these examples are helping you because that's why I have included them into, you know, my calculations. And now we're jumping into the what is the last part of the chapter. And before I tell you what this is, I don't want you to panic because I will go very quickly to these definitions since we haven't covered chapter number seven, which is centroids. And no, I'm sorry, chapter number eight, okay? I'm just, uh, I'm just going to give you the definition. In many situations, a surface area or, or a whole bean or something is subjected to uh, distributed loads. You know, maybe a huge box that is resting or if you have a bean and you have all these blocks on top of it, you usually use distributed loads. What it does, you know, it's actually, um, getting these distributed loads into an approximation of the area because we will know we have to know by theory that the area under the loading curve should be um should will should will give us you know a resultant force and that will help us with the calculations of the moment so how so so like i said everything is given in, in terms of differentials as you know and the area I mean, the curve is given by this, um, you know, function of x. And then we also know that that's actually that function of x. In order for us to study, we have to basically calculate the area of the smallest strips. And then the sum of all those strips will be the total, you know, um, force given by that area. 
So the force magnitude df acting on, on it, it's giving us the differential of that force is equals to wa, wx dx, okay? Because that's a force. If we integrate on both sides of the equation, then we get that the force will be equals to the integral of the whole length of all those little strips that I'm telling you that they have the, the height of wx and then the width of dx. And that's why we get wx dx, which is not more than the area. So the area under the curve will be actually what will give you the resultant force. And you use that in order to calculate this and simplify your calculations. That's for um, that's for the magnitude of the resultant force. So now for the distance, it's a little bit more complicated, and that's why I don't want you to panic because we're going to have a chapter that explains all of this in detail. Okay, so we need to find the position of that resultant force. In order for us to do that, we will have to calculate the moment from two different sides. You know, we have um, the force DF will produce a moment that is X DF around about 0. 0.0. The total moment about 0. 0.0, it's giving us all the different smaller pieces of FDF, you know, X DF. When you integrate that along through L, then you will get that DF, it's described as WX and therefore your moment will be equals to the integral of the whole length that multiply that has been that has been um, integrated x w d, w x dx. I'm just getting confused with all the x's, but that's one of the way. And then now, assuming that this is related to this, and now we're gonna do it with the resultant force that we just calculated in the previous slide. So assuming that that um, the resultant force acts a distance of r if we have the formula you know that the sum of all those moments is equals to um, the distance times the resultant force if we get we know that the resultant force is given by the area under the curve and therefore x will go as a constant outside of the integral and then we will get this equation if we and then if we compare the last two equations and we say that moment RO, it's equals to moment RO. And then I take this value and I plug into this equation and then I take this one and I plug it into this one by putting one, you know, or comparing both equations. I will solve both equations in terms of the centroid and that's how we'll, I will get that. So you will learn more detail later, you know, but, for, but the resultant forks acts through a point C, which is called the geometric center of centroid of the area under the curve. So basically what we do, and we have like a complex geometry, then we will need to integrate those complex geometry to approximate that complex geometry to something that we can calculate. But like I said, I wouldn't worry too much about this. This is too complicated as for the level that you have right now. And because of that, um, I have decided that in terms of what we're covering in this chapter, we only have to worry about rectangular and triangular calculations, both of them. So until you learn more about centroids, and that's what we're heading to, we will consider only rectangular and triangular loading diagrams whose centroids are well defined and shown inside of the back cover of your textbook. That's also very you know, I know this by memory. So look at, look at the inside back cover of your textbook and you should find the rectangle and triangle cases. If not, I will just develop right now. So for rectangle, it's very simple. What is the area of a rectangle? So it'll be the base times the height and the height will be given by the force, of course, and the base will be given by the distance. So when you get that, you will be able to simplify that rectangular um, distributed load into one single load equals to 4,000 pounds and that has to be located in the center of that rectangle. When it comes to triangular calculations it's a little bit more complicated because the area of a triangle will be base times the height 
divided by two. So your base will be given by the six and your height will be given by this because it's the height of the triangle and that's 600 Newton meters. When you multiply that by, by six and you divide that by two, you will get a total force of 18, 1800 Newtons. And that it's located one third from the right or from the um, right side of the triangle or two thirds from the other side. That's the definition, very simple. So, if we complete the exercise, I'm just going over this again. So, like I said, the resultant force for the rectangular load will be 400 times 10, and that will be located right in the middle, which is 5 feet because this one is 10. For the triangular load, base times height divided by 2, you get 18 newtons, and then the distance will be one third from, from the rectangular side, you know, from here, or two thirds from this side. Okay, so we have the first example or the first exercise. We need, uh, that's been given, so now we need to calculate um, the force and the location from point A. Right here, you have a triangle, and right here, you have a rectangle. If you wanna calculate those, very simple and straightforward. So the first segment is a triangle, it's space times height divided by two, you get a total of 450. The location of that triangle is two thirds from A, right? Because we wanted to know from A. And that will give you the four feet from A. In the rectangular loading, you have this. And that, it's a rectangle. If we go base times height, will be 150 times eight, that's 1200 pounds. And then the location will be the six, the first six that you have right here, and then half of the eight because it was right in the middle. That will give you a total of 10 feet from A. That's it. It's very straightforward. I don't think like you're going to have any problem with it. But now, let's say that you need to find your resultant force. Okay. So what should we do? We should basically sum both forces. So the resultant force will be equals to F1 plus F2. And that will be 450 right since we just calculated for plus 1200 and that's equals to 1650 and then the location very simple you know that the moments or the moment at a will be equals to the resultant force times the distance you can calculate moments And then we have moment around A will be equals to minus 450 that multiplies 4 and then minus 1200 that is going to multiply by 10 that will give me a negative moment of 13,800 pounds fit. And don't forget that this force is actually negative because it's pointing down, okay? Because then when you try to get this into the, when you try to get this into this equation and this into that equation, obviously you will get a positive value. So if I do my calculations, my X or the location will be equals to moment that I just calculated around A over the resultant force and that's equals to 8.36 feet from A and that's all very straightforward very easy but now I'm pretty sure you're you're you can understand the whole uh, the whole conclusion of this chapter, as we started, we were talking about moment of a couple, how to move forces into a, into a point so we can make the calculations and design our systems in a pretty easy way. And that it's it for chapter number four. 
I hope you have enjoyed my lecture. Uh, please email me if you have any questions. I'm, I will be more than happy to go over one-on-one -on -one with you so you can understand at the end of the day. My goal is that you learn something that you can carry into the next class, which is dynamics. All right, so thank you very much for watching and let me know if you have any questions.